This is a short talk I've made about finding information, sharing information and collaborating with people in science. And some people might say that sharing ideas in science is a bad idea. And I agree. And there are special methods that you can use to stop people stealing your ideas. For example, a fair amount of paranoia is important. And your ideas are your currency. And if you think everyone is trying to steal your ideas, you're probably right. I find that tinfoil is quite good. It stops the TV talking to me. And it stops our scientists taking my ideas. If I were you, I wouldn't watch the rest of this talk. If you feel you must, make sure you've got a good tinfoil hat. The first part of this talk is about using tools on the internet to collaborate with the other people you're working with. So meet Dave. Dave is a PhD student and works in the lab. And things are going well for Dave because he's made a big discovery. Dave's happy and so are his supervisors who tell him to write everything up. Dave writes the draft of the paper and then Dave types everything up. Dave then composes an email to his supervisors, attaches the draft and then sends it off. The supervisors get the draft and then start reading it. After a while, they make their corrections to the document and then send it back to Dave. And Dave gets two emails in his inbox. His first supervisor says he hates the first paragraph of the introduction. His second supervisor says he loves the first paragraph of the introduction. So Dave is in a bit of a pickle about what to do. So Dave does his best to try and update the introduction to make everyone happy and sends it back off to both supervisors who again update this with their changes and send it back to Dave. And again Dave goes back to editing the document. Dave's becoming quite stressed out with trying to keep everyone happy. And his supervisors start to get fed up about how long it's taking. And things are just going round and round in circles. Until Dave's computer crashes and everything's lost. Dave is rather upset by this. And his supervisors aren't really happy either. That's a sad ending to the story, so let's rewind and go back to the beginning. Dave is a scientist who makes a big discovery and again his supervisors tell him to write it up so Dave drafts and plans the outline but this time Dave uses Google Docs to write it instead and the great thing about this is that everything is stored on the internet instead of on Dave's computer and once Dave has finished writing the document he sends his supervisors access to the document instead of the document itself which means his supervisors go to Google Docs to look at the document they still disagree about the first paragraph of the introduction, but everyone works on editing the same version of the document, instead of multiple ones. There's only ever one version that everyone is working on. So without all the emails being sent around, the final version of the article gets written really quickly, and it gets sent off to a journal. And so Dave's suddenly got plenty of free time, something he can use to work on new experiments. Dave's computer still crashes, but the document is on the internet, not on his computer, so he can retrieve it straight away. Dave is very happy at how easy it was to write a paper and he thinks that perhaps he'll write some more. This was an example of how some of the available tools on the internet can be useful for collaborating. For example, there's only ever one version of the document you're working on. All the previous edits and versions of this document are stored online with it. And finally, it's safe online. So you don't ever have to worry if your computer crashes or is stolen. For this example, I used Google Docs, but there's also Zoho Office and Think Free, which all offer Office-like functionality. Next, I'm going to talk about tools that you can use to find information. This is Dr. Doom. This is Buddy. Buddy works in the same lab as Dr. Doom. Dr. Doom hates Buddy. Dr. Doom is working on building a powerful laser gun. However, things aren't really going very well. So Dr. Doom goes to PubMed to see what he can find on building lasers. There's quite a few articles, so Dr. Doom gets as many as he can and starts to read them. However, it's all a bit much, and Dr. Doom he starts to feel a bit overwhelmed by all the literature there is. This leaves him feeling quite upset and distressed about how his project's going to get any better. What makes it worse is that Buddy has got an attractive new girlfriend. He also mentions something about solving global warming too. This leaves Dr. Doom feeling quite upset, and understandably, quite angry at Buddy. Buddy mentions trying to look at some web tools to help him understand the field better. 
Doctor Doom doesn't usually listen to anything the buddy has to say, but this time he thinks it can't hurt having a look. First of all, he goes to SciVTV. SciVTV allows authors to upload videos of themselves discussing their papers. This is quite useful, as it allows you to read the paper but also hear what the author has to say at the same time. Next, he has a look at Jove. Jove stands for Journal of Visualised Experiments, and like SciVTV, it's a video site, the Jove tends to focus more on people's techniques, the techniques they use in their research. Open Wetware is a site like Wikipedia, where anyone can write and edit articles. However, Open Wetware focuses on biological techniques and protocols, so it's a useful resource for looking these up. After looking at these sites, Dr. Doom feels a bit more confident about building lasers. The next site Dr. Doom looks at is Postgenomic, which monitors all the scientists who blog about research. On this site, he notices that some people are blogging about the latest articles on building lasers. So Dr. Doom follows the link to the blog post, so you can see what other people are writing about the article. Finally, Dr. Doom looks at Conatea, which allows researchers to share and organise articles they're interested in. After organising his articles using Conatea, Dr. Doom notices that one has already been tagged by another user, Professor Destruction. After looking at Professor Destruction's profile, he finds some other papers that are of interest to him. So Dr. Doom is able to take this new information and apply it to his research which turns out to be exactly what he was after, and he starts to see a lot more success. And in the long run, things start going very well for Dr. Doom in his research, and in his personal life. So this was an example of the tools you can use to find information. These aren't meant to replace journal articles, but rather supplement the information that's available. There's video sites, such as SciVTV, and Jove. Many scientists like to blog about the research they're interested in, and sites like Postgenomic can help you find these blogs. And finally, there's sites that allow you to organise your bibliographic database, such as Conatea, and Site You Like. But this has been just a brief selection of the available tools, and there are plenty of others out there which can be useful. The third and final part of this talk is about using tools to share information. And for this part of the talk, I'd like you to meet me, an example of how intelligence doesn't preclude great abs or huge biceps. Of course, if this were true, I'd be out having fun instead of sitting at home on my own making stupid videos. And so far, I've been talking about using the web to collaborate and to find information. But sharing information is something different. And you could say that sharing information is somewhat risky. But it doesn't have to be risky. You could create an article on open wetware about a protocol you use a lot. You could create a video about this technique and put it on Jove, or you could create a video about one of your papers for SciVTV. Using myself as an example, I have a blog where I like to talk about some of the issues I think are important in bioinformatics. And whenever I have an idea which I think might be useful to other people, I write up a short article about it and then put it on my blog. And hopefully this is useful to other people. And these are quite safe. But it's sharing data on unpublished research which worries most people. There is a fair amount of paranoia in science that other scientists will steal your ideas. So on one hand, you should be secretive about your research to keep it safe. But on the other hand, most people work in science because they're interested in it and they want to share their ideas with other people. So using me as an example again, I'm in favour of sharing information as much as possible because I think this is good for science. And I have a second blog where I write about what I'm working on. So for anyone who's interested in my research, they can get access to it earlier. And of course, you could say this is quite risky. But I like to get a second opinion about what I should put online and what I shouldn't. And remember, any ideas that you put on the internet, you can't patent and therefore you can't commercialise. But ultimately, I think it's worth it. Because sometimes when other people read my research, it gives them an idea they hadn't thought of. They then write a reply to me on my blog, which gives me a point of view I hadn't thought of and is great for my research. So this part has been about sharing information and the same tools you can use to find information you can use to share information, such as SciVTV, Jove and Open Wetware. And if you're feeling risky and want to share a little bit of your research, 
Think about what you're doing and talk to your collaborators. Use your common sense and remember about disclosure and intellectual property. And after taking all of this into consideration, I think there are benefits to being open about your research. You can get early feedback on what you're working on. And ultimately, more sharing and collaboration in science will help towards solving the bigger problems. And for some examples of people being open about their research, check out Useful Chemistry, Rosie Redfield's research blog, and if you've really got nothing better to do, you can look at mine.